God, you guided us, you protected us. Thank you, Lord, for all for everything. Father God, we still ask you to please guide us and help us, Father God, to learn and become better people every day. And Please do for Jehovah, who shall Help us for God to continue to grow so that we become better people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, our lesson is lesson nine. The topic of the lesson is the church and education. Um, when we mighty have made mind as up of Christ, but we were jungle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. So affect, affection affectionately longing for you. We were well pleased to impact to impact to you not only only the gospel of God, but also our our own lives, because you had became dear to us. I'll hand over to HK um, to take us through the introduction of our lessons. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Good morning, everyone. We just want to thank God for taking us through the whole week, and we are here to study his word. For me, this week's lesson is quite an interesting lesson, and I also look forward to learning a lot of things through sharing and also discussions and questions that we will have. I think it covers a number of things that we always discuss in the sidelines, whether in all the, uh, the, uh, the lessons that we have, certain things that we discuss today, they normally feature in. I think say also, also have some big questions around what we discuss today. So we are dealing with, uh, dealing about uh, church and education, Christian education. What is the role of the church, perhaps put it simple, and what is the true, or what is the essence of true Christian education? So those are the two concepts that will take us through as we cover from Saturday to until Friday. A number of things will feature in there that will help us to understand what is our role and how do you view the people that we are supposed to administer this Christian education and how should you view people in the light of the cross or what Jesus would do. So the first thing that is covered on Saturday there is about, if you look at the Bible, the Bible is about the lives of people who were trying to understand the role of it in their lives and the plan of salvation. So various stories there are put across in the Bible that gives us different uh, personalities or different individuals, different families who were coming from all walks of life with different questions, some with struggles, and in some instances, they would even question very hard questions. I can pick maybe example of Job. 
who were to ask job, uh, ask God in chapter 13a the very difficult questions. And God allows that. We have other people who are struggling from maybe challenges that they face, and they come and challenge God. And there are some people who actually trick even Jesus, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees. But God had a way of engaging them in his attempt or in his uh, role to explain or to make God meaningful into their lives. So these are the things that the author want, want us, wants us to, to appreciate and understand as we deal with, with and amongst ourselves as a church or as individuals. But sometimes as, as individuals or as a church, we seem not to be able to tolerate each other or create that environment where people can grow from various challenges that they have. So the author puts it quite clear there on Saturday to say, the church should be an environment that enables people to grow and learn. It should be an open environment for open discussion, genuine discussions, and also allow people to question, to question things that they don't understand. I think if you grew up in the Adventist, uh, you would uh, agree with me to say, at some stage, we used to, 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 to create this environment. I think if, like, if you grew up in the Adventist, especially most conservative churches, the old churches that we come from, where there was this atmosphere or this environment where people were quite scared to question either you be branded as someone who doesn't believe or someone who's got issues, or that some, and a lot of things will come around. But thank God, I think as the religion, or as we are growing, we are beginning to understand the value of questions. I think at a, Kelvin is quite doing this quite very well, especially in these sessions of questions and answers. We have this environment, we might not have achieved it 100%, but we are there where we are saying we are creating an environment where people should be able to ask and grow. So the church should be that environment. So I want to borrow up something that we started last week. I think since we are to create that environment where people should ask questions, we also need to be wise in how God guides us as we minister, as we do Christian education to those who are still struggling. Because sometimes in our attempt to create that open environment, certain things can be lost. And sometimes there's some disagreements, uh, arguments along things that sometimes not build us. But the whole idea is that everyone must be comfortable. So we need to produce people who are spirit-filled, wise teachers who are able to create that environment. So in summary on Saturday, the church should enable people to grow. That's number one. The church should also be a place where people learn the knowledge of God and are able to change their course of actions for better decisions in their lives. Third point, the church should allow uh, people to be delivered, to grow spiritually. Because not only sharing of knowledge, but also as people get to know more about God, there are certain things that they learn that enable them to be delivered. So deliverance does not only come from touching of hands. It also comes from when you understand God, you are able to make certain decisions and move from a certain course of action that was driving you away from God into a, a line or into a path that makes you appreciate and see the value of God in your life. So in other words, the church should be taken serious as that environment that enables a Christian education. That's the summer on, 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 on Saturday. Moving on to, to Sunday. Something interesting there, true Christian education on Sunday. Uh, we are given a story of this rabbi who in a class there was this sleeping student, almost sleeping student. And then he posed a very good question that lays the foundation of what we want to discuss about. He says, when does someone know that the night has ended and the day has begun? Remember this guy was about to sleep. It's kind of a philosophical question, rhetoric, a very difficult question, but what the, uh, the, the rapper wanted to intend is what will emphasize on, on the summer. So various responses came. For me, those responses, they are more of or trying to, to see that they are critical, they are fine, thin issues of life uh, in the, uh, that we need to understand. And the, and the rabbi says, when he ends, he says, we know that the night has ended and the day has begun as human beings or as Christians, when we are able to see a new soul and look at that soul, the person that we have never seen, and actually say to this person, this person is a brother and a sister in Christ. So one of the things that we put across actually by the author, if you read the, the, the comment in the just edition, he says, so the issue of Christian education starts with the soul. If as a church or as Christians, we understand 
that we need to look at other people or other souls as candidates of heaven, it then enables us to do or create a proper environment or proper Christian teaching. So in that question, what I wanted to summarize or put across is that whatever we do, if it does not translate into seeing other people as brothers and sisters in Christ, then it's of no avail. Then it's, it's in vain. We might as well stop. So this is a quite powerful. And then it also uh, added by the story in Luke chapter 10, verse uh, uh, 30 to 37. We know the story, the Good Samaritan, I think we've been studying it for some time, where we see a Levite and a priest. Actually, I want to start from here. Normally these titles, a, a Levite, a priest, a doctor, or a teacher, they are aligned to the work that you are doing. So when someone says you are a teacher, he knows that you are teaching. When you are a doctor, you are dealing with so when you are a doctor, you are dealing with uh, med, med, uh, in, the, in the medical field, you are in dealing with healing of people and all so forth. So the same concept there in chapter 10, Luke chapter 10, the priest and the Levite sees a Samaritan who is falling amongst the robbers. Instead of acting as their title is saying, a Levite, in other words, when the Samaritan had fallen amongst the robbers, he was praying, I want to assume, to say, if a priest could pass, uh, pass through, or if a Levite would pass through, I would be helped. But on the contrary, these people, they passed through and went on their normal journeys. So in other words, they did not live up to what their titles are. But a good Samaritan, putting Christian education into action, when he saw him, he did something good for, the, for that. So in other words, the lesson that we can, we can pick up from there is that our titles as Christians, our name as Adventists, we are the remnant, we can call ourselves all the names, we know all the things that we know. It will be no good if it cannot be translated into what people expect of us. So in other words, if people say, yeah, there is a Christian, there should be some corresponding works to it. So in other words, the Levites did not live up to Christian education. As same as the rapper is illustrated to say, you, you cannot say the day or the night has ended and the day has begun if you cannot see another soul and say, this is a Christian brother or a Christian sister. Good environment, good things that are picked up from these stories, it says that there are certain things that are affecting our way of doing this Christian education or showing the value, the souls that they have in the sight of Christ. The author is picking up social or environmental issues that we have and there are some prejudices that are coming from our cultures or from the way we see things and they are affecting Christian education. I think more than anything else for me, I think they even also the economic environment. We are living in a, a survival kind of environment. So that survival kind of environment makes us to fight and makes us not to see each other as Christians. I think for me, I sum, I sum it up this way to say, there is this suspicion that Maybe the resources are not enough. God is not going to provide enough resources for us to survive as human beings. And that they are impacting on our way we are doing Christian education. So in other words, we are looking at each other in that view. So, but the author, or what is pushing up there is that our Christian education should stem not only from our titles, but it should stem from the actions that we do and then that, that translate into be seen as good works same as the good Samaritan, as that story of the good Samaritan. So he's saying uh, true Christian education, if nothing else, must cause us to rise above these human foibles and evils and see others as Christ see them. So if we uplift the cross, people will see Jesus. So then I want to end there on, 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 on standard there by this question. I think we need to engage in, on it. It says, what prejudices does your culture or a society teach either subtly or even open that as Christians we must rise above? So I think there are certain things that we can, all of us, either as, as a community or as a team or as individuals, there are certain things that we carry. These are prejudices that we have that stem from our culture, that stem from our education, that stem from the way we view things that we need to look into and evaluate that impact on Christian education or that impact on our view as we see other people uh, and you look at them not as candidates or not as souls that Christ died, but we see them as inferior. I think this is important as we will engage on. Moving on to, to Monday, called to live as the light. I think one of, this is one of the most powerful um, sermons that Jesus preached. We normally call it the Beatitudes or the Sermon on the Mount. Amongst them, he, Jesus says to them, I want to read there, and he says, 
You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bow. Instead, they put it on the stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good works, your good deeds and glorify your father in heaven. This is a powerful illustration. I think those who lived in the rural areas quite actually understand this. When you were to light those candles or whatever, those uh, man-made lights, we would put them on a table so that it lights the whole house. Even in the modern societies, tall buildings like the Vodacom, wherever you are, you can see it from most, and even other tall buildings in other countries or wherever. So in other words, something that is good should not be hidden, it should be visible. If it's a tall building, it should be visible. If it's a light, it should be on top of the table. So he's saying, us as Christians, we need to be the light of the world, a city that's set on a hill that cannot be hidden. I think those who followed up postings from Pastor Mvunele this week, he wrote something I, I actually really uploaded him for. Should be on Monday or Tuesday, I can't remember very well. He was teaching, uh, he, was, he wrote something along these lines to say, we say the country is a, a Christian country, but if you look at the levels of evils or the things that are happening, let's pick that's the simple one, the current one, the gender-based violence. It doesn't make sense that in a Christian country, all these things are happening. It doesn't make sense. So the question, the, the simple question would be, not a question would be, are these crimes committed by Christians? Or is our impact as Christian or Christian education not changing the world? I think it's a good question to engage ourselves on. Because the assumption is Christians should do good, good deeds. So if it's a Christian country, then there should be good deeds. The level of evil cannot be as, as alarming as we are seeing. So it's a good thing to engage on. The author says, when we talk about evil there on, on the introduction, it's not something that you, you read in books, read, see in news. It is as good as where you are. The level of evil is quite alarming. It's engulfing the world. The darkness is engulfing the world. And that should cause, or that should call us as Christians to say, we either not doing our work, or we only just listening to knowledge, and we are not translating that knowledge into what God intends us to be. So we are called to be the light of the world. We are called to be a seed that is only here that people will see it, not only in our families, not only in our private space. I think the challenge between me and you is that we only sense this issue of being good when we are praying and when we need good things from God. As soon as God gives us, I think we go back to our old ways. We are not impacting. Maybe a good thing would be if you are a, a supervisor at work or a manager at work, or look at your organization, how many Christians are there, but how many challenges are there? Are we impacting the right thing or are we changing the world? So the, the call is, you are the light of the world. So the author says, these words were not said um, when everything was good. Maybe we might give an excuse to say, but no, Jesus was talking about his disciples. Then things were quite different. The author says he was speaking to the disciples or to the crowd who were under a rule, the Roman, the Roman rule by then, oppressive rule as we hear from history. But Jesus was calling them that you are the light of the world. Light of the world. In other words, that calling is not exempting them no matter what conditions are. They need to do it. In other words, it's a higher calling that we need to. We need to be that light of the world. I think it's a good thing that we need to discuss this morning, uh, to discuss this morning, that Jesus is calling us to be, to be the light of the world and we need that impact. I work in a profession where we call, okay, we, everyone must be ethical. But for me, that the issues of around ethics, for me, in the Christian world would be the issues of being good or being a Christian. In other words, if you look at the world in all spheres, you can call issues different names, being Ubuntu, being ethics, being whatever you, you, you can call it. But all that they are looking for is a, a true reflection of a true human being. In the Bible explanation, as I hand over to Tant, in a true a Bible explanation is that they are looking for a Christian. So this morning we are dealing with the church Christian education and the impact that it should have. Over to Tandi. Thanks, HK. Thank you for that intro. Um, happy Sabbath, everyone. So looking at the church and Christian education, I think if you've been following the lesson, then you know that when we talk about Christian education, we're not talking about academics. 
but we're talking about building the entire person holistically with Christ at the center of that. So on Tuesday, we're looking at living, living as disciples. What does it mean to be a disciple? So to be a disciple is to remind ourselves that at the center of everything that we do is Christ, because you're a disciple of who, right? Because there's a lot of discipling that's happening out there, but who are, who are you being a disciple of? So Christ should be the center of this church in this education that you're talking about. And what Christ did is he actually trained his disciples because what disciples are is basically you're in a position where you are learning, you're sitting at the feet of someone and you're learning. And the purpose of that is that you will then be sent out. So as disciples, we are we are then taught everything that Christ needs for us to be to equip us with so that we'll be able to actually go out there. And what are some of those things? Well, if you look at Luke 4 verse 18, um, his message to his followers is that, and I'm going to read verse 18 and 19. It says, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So you're a disciple to further the mission of those, that, that who you're learning under. And if Christ's mission is that he's here to spread love, to spread grace, to spread forgiveness, to spread freedom, we are disciples being equipped to be able to do that as we go out there as well. So the church is a center of its, um, it's an incubation space for people who will then go out and spread this. So your discipleship process is not a life, is a lifelong process, but there's a, there's a moment where you are sitting at the feet of Christ and doing the academics. And then there's, there's a time where you need to go out and do the practicals. When we look at the life of the disciples with Christ, they were with him for three and a half years. That three and a half years, and I was thinking about it, an average degree in South Africa and in fact across the world is three years. So that that was their university, that was their tertiary education to sit at, and, and study and learn. But it wasn't just sitting and discussing and discussing. There were elements of it that were practical. There were times where Christ would send them out on their own. There's a time where he sent them out and he said, go two by two. So there's a practical element to it. So there, there's a purpose to being a disciple there's a purpose to, 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 to sitting there and studying. And so when we come to church, church should be a place of learning with a purpose. I'm going to learn this so what? There should be a mission focus to our learning. So it's not just to be bloated with academic theory. It's not just to be bloated with knowledge. It should be that there's a purpose that it's driving towards, that I have this, this information, this knowledge that's then going to equip me to go and then further the mission. So he, he taught them things that he needed to teach them. And at times he was teaching. So if you look at, at the Sermon on the Mount, that was the, the, the classroom, the teaching. But at times it was practical. It was observed. This is what I'm doing. He was dealing directly with the people who needed to be affected. And they were watching because they needed to know how he did the things that he did as well. So just as Christ says, the spirit ordained him to come and do these things. He's passing it on to us as his disciples to say, as disciples today, you also then need to live purposefully in spreading the word, in fellowshipping, in worshiping. So our coming to church cannot just be merely for our own edification and it ends there. You come to church with the purpose of what can I learn here so that I can take it out there and out there being anywhere. It could be in a community, it could be in your family, it could be in the workplace as, as HK has indicated. But coming to church can't be the be all and end all of our journey as Christians, then we're not really following in the footsteps of the Christ who, who, whose disciples we claim to be. And this was the difference between Christ and the rabbis at the time. They loved the, the academic theorizing and debate and the scholarship. And, and I mean, I'm not minimizing the value of that, but it, it almost ended there. And when you needed them, you had to come to the temple to find them. And Christ came and turned that, you know, on its head and he said, you need to go to the people. So when we minister with, to, to the people who are following his footsteps, when we share the good news with the people who are following his footsteps, but there's a method, there's, 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 he needs to be at the center of this. So it's not, well, this is what I think it's, he actually needs to be at the center of this. So see your role as a disciple, as a student, as a learner, but as a learner who needs to graduate everywhere you are you have to finish your metric, you have to finish that diploma, you have to finish. So wherever you are that you're learning, there's, there, there's, a, there's a graduation and an application of the learning. 
we can't be coming to church just ad infinitum for the sake for the sake of coming to church. There's a point at which we actually need to start applying, and in small doses, in small controlled do doses, we start applying it to ourselves. We start applying it in our families, but you need to broaden the scope of where you're applying this education that you're learning. So when we look at, at Wednesday, we encourage to actually learn. We, we encourage to ask questions because when you start applying, when you start sharing this knowledge, you're going to be asked questions. And if we don't have the culture of asking questions and, and discussing and seeking the truth, that's when we become defensive and get stuck when people ask us questions that we had not prepared for. Or, or questions that we don't want to entertain or questions that we haven't actually sought out. So um, I like the quote that they give I, Albert Einstein. They actually quote a scientist, a modern day scientist, who talks about the fact that we need to be curious. The, it, it's important as learners to have a mindset of curiosity. You need to want to know more. OK, you need to want to seek what what else is out there. And the last line on the quote, uh, which is what I found fascinating, was it is never lose a holy curiosity. So, again, this curiosity must still be driving you towards who is Christ and what is he trying to teach me? Because there is a, there is there is seeking that actually pushes you away from the Lord. So we need to be prayerfully be seeking, but we need to be seeking. We need to ask questions. We need to encourage asking questions. Those of you who've taught uh, kids or even like teenagers will know there's a lot of questions that come through, but there's also different type of teachers. There, the teachers will will shut down the question and be like, oh no no no, this is not time for that, or that's not the right question. And the teachers who open up and say, okay, let's discuss it. What's your thinking on that? And I think we encourage to be the letter to to say, if someone has a question, there's a natural curiosity there. How do we help them out? How do we help them? And there's a lot of verses that. <laughs> Oh, excuse me. There's a lot of verses that encourage that. There's a lot of verses. So Isaiah, God says, come, let us reason together. Reasoning is assuming I'll put a point across, you put a point across, and then I say, no, that doesn't make sense. Then he says, no, look at it this way. So there's a there's a back and forth and, and, and me trying to, to unravel my thinking around that. In Jeremiah, he says, they will seek me and find me, those who seek me dilig diligently. So again, there's a, there's a searching, there's a yearning, there's a wanting for truth that's actually out there. And when we don't encourage that, we shut people down very quickly. We're, when we, and people learn not to ask questions. And when people don't ask questions, they'll either ask them elsewhere or they'll sit and, and be content with the little knowledge that they have. Now, there's nothing as dangerous as little knowledge because you think that's the sum total of what is out there to actually know. So churches should be places of learning. Churches should be places that encourage this questioning and curious. And we grew up in environments where it didn't. I mean, uh, those of you, I'm looking at the list and I don't know if there's any other Kosa speaking person here, but those of you who are closer would know there's a there's a there's a there's a, a term that we grab knowing called uno condoni. Okay, so this is what it means. Whenever you see something and you and you say kukondoni pa meaning what's in there, right? And the adult would then have to ask to answer. But when the adult can't answer, they'll shut you down by saying, Stop being uno condoni. So stop being the person who's always asking, what's that? What's in there? What's there? And in that and you and you and it wasn't an affectionate term. When you get called uno condoni, basically that irritating child who's always asking questions that they shouldn't be asking. We bring that culture into our church environment as well. And we don't create a space where our kids can ask questions that, and I think a lot of times it's because the parents didn't know how to answer them or they didn't think the answer is appropriate for a child that age. We do that as well, even as adults, we shut each other down. We, 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 or we answer in a way that makes someone feel stupid. You know, you know, when someone answers and, and the, the tone is, well, this is obvious, you should know. It shuts further questions down as well. But we encourage to seek the truth. We, we encourage to ask questions and to know that all the answers that we seek about life are actually in the Bible. So the study will help us to find the answers that we're seeking for. So as disciples, we're being trained. We hear we're in this school, we're in this environment that's both academic and practical. We're learning the information, the theory, but we're also applying it as we learn. And our scope of application grows as we grow. And we're encouraged to ask questions. And then on Thursday, we're encouraged to then share our lives with those around us. So as I said, Christ, Christ would still be here if his purpose was, oh, let's just all hang around, let's hang out together. No, he lived for 33 and a half years. His mission was three and a half years. So he, 
he, there was a deliberate timing and then he left. And then he says, I, I, now you go out there and do the same, go out there and teach and make disciples and baptize. And, and we encourage to do that because we need to live this life and spread this gospel. And um, those of you who know network marketing, that's how network marketing works, the works, isn't it? I reach one, one reaches one, or I reach two, two reaches five. We encourage to do that as well. And we encourage to then become apostles. So part of your growth is you're no longer just a disciple sitting, learning, absorbing, uh, unpacking, understanding, doing little practicals. You're now an apostle. And an apostle is the one who's going out there and, and, and doing, you know, bigger, taking more with more confidence. And sharing our lives in First Thessalonians, Paul talks about that. He says, we're sharing our lives. We need to be apostles. We need to know that our role is now bigger. There's a point where you you ramping up you're amping up what it is that you're actually doing but this the tone of how we do it is still about with gentleness and kindness i want to read verse six and eight first thessalonians two verse six and eight to six to eight it says we're not looking for praise from men not from you or anyone else as apostles of christ we should have a burden to you but we were gentle amongst you like a mother caring for her little children and this is not the first time this 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 image of a, of a mother hen is used in the Bible. But when you those of us who've, who've grown up or visited the rural areas, you know that a mother hen is the most protective of the little from the eggs to the chicks until they're ready to go. Even when they are out there, the mother hen is actually not too far, protecting them, feeding them, taking care of them, gently loving them. And 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 Paul says that's the type of apostles we are to be. We are to be protective, gently caring, loving, making sure that we help disciple those who've come after us to also grow so that they can become apostles as time goes on. But this doesn't require, again, a broad uh, put up the tent and big things. I mean, if you look at Matthew 18, verse 20, it says, where two or three are, are gathered, there I am amongst them. So any moment, any time where there are people around you is an opportunity. It's an opportunity and we need to see it that way. It's an opportunity for you to, to do church, right? So, Because church is not the building. Church is not Ethel. Church is us gathering together. It's where people come together with the purpose of learning more about Christ and spreading Christ's love. So we, we, we do that to people as well. And it says um, where, we first, where, where people then first learn about Christ is in us sharing our lives with them, is in, in how we treat them is in how we, we, we deal with them, is in what they see in us. And when they see, when they, there's a sense of community, when there's a sense of love, when there's a sense of kindness, and this word kindness has, has come up quite a lot in, in the lesson this week. When there's that sense, then people will then be curious and want to be discipled, right? And, and that kindness can come in many forms. Christ went around feeding people, healing people, applying to their immediate needs before then taking them on this on this on this journey and sometimes it went parallel but there's a there's a kindness that's required from us as apostles as as Paul puts it as mother hands who come and 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 encompass and protect and take care of and nourish and our churches should be places of that so when you go out when you when you follow the the the, the commission it's because you've come from an environment that's taught you that and you put basically putting that across as well. So whether it's it's through the teachings, whether it's through the, the the soup kitchens or the feeding schemes or whatever it is that we're doing that we're taking out there, it should never be from a point of superiority. It should never be from a point of we here to rescue you. And I think that's that's one of the big issues with, for example, community services uh, initiatives that we have. If you're going there and and the attitude is me. I'm here to come and fix you, then we're not spreading the kindness that's required of us. But when we go there and we say, how can we do this together? How can we actually work together? So we need to add value in the places where we are, we are apostles. We need to add value beyond just the, well, let me come and teach you about the three angels message or the second coming. How are you actually adding value? And there's a quote that's in, in the teacher's commentary that I like to say is, of what value or effect is all doctrinal light we possess as a church if we haven't learned to be kind to one another? So we can have all the information that we have, but if we haven't learned to be kind to one another, if we haven't learned to apply the fruit of the spirit 
as we put this across, then it's actually of no value. And, and it says the right message with the wrong spirit helps the cause of Satan rather than the cause of God. I thought that was actually, yeah, think about it. The right message with the wrong spirit helps the cause of Satan rather than the cause of God. So Satan will use you to go out there and quote verses and, 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 and have big debates about, you know, doctrinal issues, but you actually are furthering his cause and you're not furthering the cause of God. So we need to really be mindful of our, of our tone and texture and attitude as we are out there being apostles. We need to be these mother hands that are protecting and surrounding people. And it will start with, with where, where HK started. When we, know, when we realize that everyone is a child of God and everyone, God loves everyone, right? You are just a vessel that's being used at that point in time to go and minister to them, whatever those needs are. So in Romans 12, again, we encourage, be kindly, affectionate to one another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another. You, you're not fully sharing your life as a proper apostle if what you're thinking is to go out there and be doctrinally correct. That's not what we're called to do. We're called to, to bring a, a, a holistic value adding approach as, as apostles. Uh, the summary, the quote from The Desire of Ages in page 299, there's just a few lines that I want to read for you there and then we really would like to have a conversation about what does this mean to you, especially in light of the fact that we've had church, we haven't gone to the building for the last six months, eight months, okay, since April, right? You can't say we haven't had church, but what has that meant to you and, 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 and what is it going to mean going forward? So um, Ellen White brings us back again to the fact that um, our center of all of this should be Christ. He says, when Christ was ministering to people, when Christ went around talking to people, when Christ was preaching the Sermon on the Mount, for example, he did not make a direct attack on the errors of people. He saw the misery of the world on account of sin, yet he did not present them with the vivid delineation of their wretchedness. So he didn't go out there and point to them how, how wretched they are or how sinful they are. What he did was he taught them something infinitely better than what they'd known. He offered them a, a better alternative. So his attitude was not that of, I'm going to show you guys just how, how terrible you are. His approach was, I'm going to show you what the alternative is, what the better alternative is. And I think that's what we need to be able to do as, 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 as Christians and as disciples and as apostles. We need to be able to offer people alternatives that are better to their current realities, such that it's something that they want, not because they're feeling condemned for their current realities, but because we're offering them something that is better. And we need to be able to show them that there is better out there. Um, life could be better. Life could be more hopeful. Life could be nicer, like, you know, that there is better. So we, you, you can do that without vilifying people, knocking them out, knocking them down for what they're currently doing, but by just showing them you know, the love and the kindness of Christ itself and showing them what the kingdom of God looks like because that's what they actually need to see. They need to see the truth of the kingdom of God in how they're being treated right now. So that's really the lesson that, that, that you know, the church and Christian education is we need to learn to be these, these, these apostles. We start off as disciples, but become apostles and we go out there, but what we are learning it, how we're learning it, and then how we're putting it out there will impact who we, say, who we show the world who Christ is. I don't know if there are any thoughts or any comments that we can open up for. Um, we, we have good time, we have 20 minutes of discussion. Even if you didn't study the lesson, you have had experience of being a church member. Some of you may have been born to parents who are Adventists, but some of us didn't. So you know when you started joining the church, what have been some of the experiences and what has actually kept you here till this far? And what would you like to see being done differently, being taught differently, being handled differently so that we are value adding as the church in our mission to teach people about who Christ is? Today I can see everyone who's on the screen, so I'm going to start calling out names. So please ready yourself. But any any comments or any hands up? HK, from your side. 
I think maybe a reaction you picked up a quote somewhere. Maybe just read it and also add something to it. Because on Sunday, when it says, as Adventists, the Adventists, we have been blessed with abundance of doctrinal light and truth. And then it goes on to say, even if the most Christian world still doesn't understand yet, however crucial these truths are, they don't do anything if we are not effective. I'm not using the word kind. I think for me, I have reactions to that. I think there is a group of us, or we are coming from that space where we've been so good about what we are as Adventists. <laughs> and I'm thinking in the light of what has been happening currently in the religious space, where were we as Christians with our good doctrines? We, had, we never participated, we never had an impact. So I'm saying um, is we are so comfortable about the truth that we hold. But one thing that we forget again is that these truths or these doctrines that we have, no matter how good they are, they were developed over a long period of time by other people. And some of us, we are taking them at summer level. So if people are engaging us in questions, some of us don't have enough detail to defend some of them. So, so I think they are, of, they are of no use if we just pride ourselves in them. So in other words, this pushes us to give a space to allow other people to ask. Even the very Sabbath itself or the doctrine of death and what, what. I think the author is challenging us deeper to say, let's allow that space to engage. Adventists generally don't want to engage. You would take other people as ignorant. I think for me, this is a life-changing thing as a church and also myself. Thank you. Thanks, HK. Mem um, Simanga, I see your hand is up. And then after you, because Nati, I see you made a comment, but I'd actually like you to unmute yourself and speak. So after Mem Simang, uh, because Nati will Thank hand you. over to you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Tandu. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. You know, this lesson was so liberating. It touched on so many things that we deal with. Um, so at a, at a corporate level, it, uh, Ellen White also emphasizes this a lot to say that education is not about us regurgitating information and sitting with it. It is us. Uh, uh, it is about us uh, bringing in, in other words, uh, getting the information, but interrogating it so that we can apply it. And it's so amazing that. Ellen White writes about this, the Bible, you've just read a few verses that uh, confirm this, but the entire culture of what we call church is such that it is discouraging of that. And you have alluded to it and HK has also alluded to it. So I don't want to spend too much time on it to say, when you come to church, it's not an environment that encourages us to say, um, let me go and find, or let's say you're reading something and you say, oh, I'll go to church and then I'll get more explanation about this. Because by nature, the, pro, the way programming is done, the interaction is done, it tends to be, you know, you know, there's someone who's going to talk and we all nod our heads. There's really not, it's not an environment that allows everybody to ask that question. So maybe what we should have more is Bible studies, I don't know, something, but something that allows each and every person to feel like they have an opportunity to ask questions. Because there, and this leads me to what I really wanted to ask. Tandy, you talked about, you made an analogy of how church Oh, Christ was on earth for three years and how that is, um, uh, it would be equate to our university degree of three years. And if we say that's the case, then church would also be a, an institution of learning of sorts. And if we were to write and examine church, I honestly think we would all fail. And this is why the application of what we learn we see ourselves failing in that. Because the question I always ask myself now is really truly, is, is church, and I'm using church as a representation of Christ. Is it a solution to social ills that we see on earth today? So if we look at what's happening on earth, if we look at the issues that people are affected with, people who do not, who do not know Christ, do they look at Christians? They, do they look at us and say, perhaps I can find a solution from those people because through how they live or through what they do, it looks like they offer something different from me who's struggling. So whether the person is struggling 
financially, whether they're struggling relation-wise, whether they're struggling, and, and which is what is overwhelming us now. Today, we're in the 16 days of activism, activism but it's, we're calling it, what is it, a pandemic now, a gender-based violence, is pandemic, but we are here as Christians. Do these people look at us and say, perhaps let's go to the church, it will solve my problem. Do people who have, if we look at the pandemic or what is this thing that we are dealing with, coronavirus, is the church there as a source of healing? Is this, so what are we, what is really our selling proposition and why is it that we are failing so much to have that impact that Christ has left us with when he went to end? And those are the questions that I struggle with a lot. And this lesson really touched on all of them in every angle. And I was saying, it would be nice for us just to discuss, is there things that we can change? Is this meant to be something that I do as an individual? Have we agreed that corporately we can't do anything as a church? And really, I suppose this is not a comment. It's not a question. It's, I don't know what it is. It's just a conglomeration of my thoughts at this stage. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Gosnati, uh, please unmute yourself and, and elaborate on your comment for us. Uh, well, from my side, um, I didn't get the chance to read the lesson studies, but I was just referring to a comment that you made earlier to say um, most people that were born of um, SDA or Adventist parents, I think they feel more at home compared to someone who comes from an external um, environment and comes in. But I'll, talk, I'll give an example. Of, um, I'll just make reference to myself. I mean, I was born in the church and I think I've been attending, if I'm not mistaken, plus minus three years um, at Calvin. But the fact that I was born in, in, in this denomination, I don't have any issues with not um, being included. You know, because I've, I've learned in the past that we might, we might learn the Bible and the doctrines and, and how we're supposed to live as Christians. But as Adventists, and I might be wrong, this is my own opinion, I think it's, it's, it's difficult for us to show that we actually care about people. Now, if Nyagwazalwani, you know, I don't know, I think they show more love instead of doctrines. As Adventists, I think we're more focused on doctrines than actually showing people that we care about them, regardless of any environment that they would come from or if they know the Bible. But I think if I was not born of an Adventist family, it would be difficult for me to join the Adventist um, church. Mm. So, yeah, that's... That's, that's me. That's that's a sad indictment, honestly. Hey? But it's 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 a it's a it's a sentiment that's repeated over and over. And it's not about whether it's because oh well, it's a church in the suburbs and we're generally, um, you know, not community oriented. It's it's seeped down to even our churches in the townships or even in the rural areas. There's there's this culture that everyone complains about, but we're not doing anything to fix it. You know. Um, we are, and, and there's, there's, a, there's a paragraph that I want to read as well that just challenges us. It says, when one designates themselves as a Christian, it usually evokes the idea that we adhere to a set of beliefs, right? And, that, and that's true. But the, the challenge is, what if we self-designated as disciples and, instead of Christians? And I like what Nkosnati said, because he said, Abba Zalwan, and we already automatically know who that is. Is it because, you know, we're not Abba Zalwan? Do you know what I mean? There's, there's a certain mindset and attitude and, and, and culture that we associate with in Gonzo Abba Zalwan. But the, the, the lesson writer is actually saying here as well, what if we self-designated as disciples? And what does he mean by disciples? He says disciples are students, they're hands-on learners, and they're apprentices. Of course, they believe what they were taught, but they're more than just believers. They learn the skills of their masters so that they can repeat them. They make life carriers of some craft that their masters were involved in, of the same craft that their master was involved in. And when the master dies, his disciples are the closest thing to an advertisement for the ideals and practices to which the master devoted his life. So maybe that's the problem, is that we don't see ourselves as disciples. We don't see ourselves as students who should be sitting there learning, putting on hands on practicals. We're seeing ourselves as academics, as theologians, and people who, who at, at, at intellectual level should be well, but that's it. Um, and so people who come looking for 
the warmth of the hands-on practical, don't see it. But if you're looking for uh, intellectual debate, you will find it. But is that really what we should be about? Is that really what church should be about? And, and how do we fix this? Because we can, again, go on having the same complaint. How do we fix it? How do we make it different? What do we do now to play our parts now that we see that that's not working? So if, we, if we're saying we're lacking warmth and kindness, what can I do to apply that, right? One of the ways that, that Kelvin as a church grew when we were in the old church and there were a few of us is that we had the Sabbath lunch that was open to everyone. And that was a form of, of fellowship. And it was a time where you'd actually sit and get to know each other. We didn't get to know each other during the lesson study or during the worship service, but the lunch time was a time we actually sat and there was fellowship and getting to know each other. So things like those that, that, that break down the walls that break down the barriers. What are some of those things that we can do in the context that we find ourselves in? I think is what we should be occupying ourselves with. What can we do to make sure that when people come to church, it's a relevant space to make them disciples so that they can go out there and be these gentle apostles when the time comes. I think it was Pastor Papu who made this analogy, or I could be wrong, but one of the pastors I remember stuck with me said, um, we treat, if, if you're a car, there's two, there's two places that the car goes to. There's the filling station, okay? And then there's the garage. Okay, so I'm, I'm distinguishing those. So a garage for parking, not a garage. <laughs> there's a garage for parking, there's a filling station. So it's either you see a church as the filling station where you go and you get filled up and you drive off and you go and you use the fuel. Or you see a church as a garage where you come and you switch off and you park and you sit there, right? And that's sometimes the mindset when we go to church. If you see, if you see coming to church as this place where you're going to switch off and just sit there, then you're not you're not on a sense of mission. You're not there to say, I need to fill up because I need to drive somewhere. Because the, the cars don't park at the filling station. They fill up, they check your oil, your tire, and whatever, because you have a mission. You have to drive off. And so baby church should be that for us. There should be a sense of urgency of going out. We shouldn't be so comfortable to just sit and park and switch off. There should be a sense of, okay, you know, when is the practical, when are you applying? And what are those things that we're applying? We're applying the fruits of the spirit as a starting point. We're applying the fruits of the spirit. Any other thoughts? So, HP so, so Tandi, can I ask a direct question? Mm. In the same way that we studied the Bible, this much, the, the, in other words, the theory. Do we take it for granted that the fruit of spirit would, um, would just emerge from studying or do we need to be deliberate as a church? Remember the pro, this whole thing of programming is man-made. Do we need to be deliberate and say, we want to, what do you call it? A mission that goes out there and be kind. We want to emit uh, disciples that are kind. How mm. do we help or train people to be kind or do we is it is it is it something that's given is it something that we can't train because i feel like we're continuing in the same way but we're expecting different results we already know that it is we know adventists are known for their truth but very little empathy very little of spirit very they're very they want to sit with you and be academic about the bible but they might pass you there when you are struggling what mm. is it that we can do as people who have learned this lesson to say we need to be different so that we can look back in a year's time and say, this is how we, uh, through learning this lesson, we've acted differently and we've become more of what Christ would have wanted out of us. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to appoint two people to think about and answer that question as I give my thoughts. Phyllis, please ready yourself and Lerato, I'm reading the names on the screen. So if it's not, it's if, if you're not Lerato, whoever's using Lerato's login details, Lerato Mokalaike, please look at that as well. What are the practical ways that we can apply this, this lesson? That we are this, this center, church is this center where we get taught to be these disciples that are living the fruits of the spirit, and then we need to actually go and apply it. What are, what are some of those things? So here's my thoughts before I hand over to Phyllis. One of the things I thought of during the week was, Again, one of the things that worked really well for us, and I think it just, we needed to maybe find a way to harness it was having cell groups. The cell group system, it, it, it works. Firstly, it's a smaller environment where people get to know each other really well. And, and then you can, you can, 
without the formalities of church and programming as 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 you identify them so without those formalities you're in someone's home yes there's still a purpose we're here to 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 study or we're here to whatever it is that we're here to do for that week but there's a sense of family there's a sense of community there's a sense of there's someone i know who's not too far from me that even during the week i can say hey you know what can we just pray about this or we also get to know what our everyday challenges are so that's one way that i, I thought even in this time of pandemic, uh, I think maybe we could have done that. It's okay, we can't gather in our hundreds in the church today, but what are you doing in our areas? I'm in polls off, who else is around my area and what are we doing? Even if it's virtually, what are we doing? And now that we're in stage one, we can actually visit each other, what are we doing? So that could be some of the practical things that I'm thinking of. Phyllis? Okay, I just wanted to alert you to, to the hands that were up. Okay. There were two more hands, I think. Okay, that, I see. I see, Sylvia. That's awesome. All right. What's your comment? Was also Jesper. Jesper. Jesper was a hand up that side. Okay. Yeah. I wanted to say that um, I've been listening and it's quite an interesting topic. Uh, church, normally church goes through phases where there's maybe too much activity at one time where we get involved, where we are busy learning and it's all happening. But it also goes through another stage where we go down. There is some slackening. You remember where the 10 virgins, where we go, we sleep as a church. I would want to believe that we are at that stage where we there's too much tearing. Why? You have, we know that the Bible says knowledge will increase. And it really has increased during our phase. I, I actually uh, get uh, touched by the fact that we are not seeing it as, as a church, that our, our children, the youth and the little ones, we are not moving up according to the stages of how knowledge is increasing in terms of our religion. We have not upped that level to the extent that our children and the youth are no longer interested in church. Why? Because there's more alternatives for them now where there is more interest. We are caught up in this uh, uh, tearing stage and you will notice that we, you will not find them in all these discussions. In church, you know, in, in, in classes, they are no longer interested because we, 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 we were not uh, uh, upgrading as much as we were supposed to. And at the same time, I would like to believe that a family, remember it's a small group, is the most effective place to impact a lot of these attributes that we, 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 we desire in people like the learning one and the, 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 the teaching kids to be kind and all that. If you do it at home, and then it's the church is then meant to just what boost it up. Otherwise, it needs a foundation elsewhere. And home is the best, best place to put a foundation of all that. And you will also find that even in, in homes, children have now options of entertaining themselves. And if as parents, we don't see that, they are spending more time elsewhere instead of them learning about uh, uh, Christ and all the positive at church attitudes we still will lose it even in the home thank you for that thank you for thank you thank you phyllis um i know i did pick on the right i don't know if there's someone there and then there's there's sylvia there's jasper and mom simanga your hand is up i don't know if it's up again or it was up from the previous time no wait, i forgot to put it down sorry sorry no problem so lerato Sil sylvia and then uh, uncle jay um, thank you. Happy Sabbath for everyone. Um, what I wanted to say is, is very brief. I am a new Adventist. Um, I didn't grow up in the church, newly baptized, and still trying to find my feet. Um, I have said this in, in our baptismal class as well. It's it, it, it's sad, but it's true that we don't get, you don't get a lot of warmth and, um, you know, 
welcoming, uh, according to, to what um, Sister Tandi was saying, that um, nobody has said you can't ask questions, but when you look around, you find that people are not quite approachable. So you sort of huddle in your little corner and try to, you know, the few people that you can talk to, relate to, and, and, and try and find answers to things. But um, I agree, although I don't have any solutions, we do have to, to do um, like a, 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 a very drastic flip of, of what is happening right now and just try something completely new, radically new. Um, what we have done um, with two of the, the ladies that we were newly baptized with, we are, you know, we, we, we have tried to, you know, keep together, pray together, um, share lessons, scriptures, um, um, meet once in a while, uh, you know, go on, on something, go on a hike and whatever, and try to study um, additional material that we can find uh, where at the moment we have uh, sort of uh, uh, trying to, to, to formalize like a little group of a, a reading, a reading club where we are doing church related material, uh, trying to go through uh, uh, the LNG wise material that we can find. Um, but, you know, such, such um, solutions, if they are not church wide, they are just they in our little corner doing us doing what we are doing doesn't it is it, not quite effective um because fortunately for us we found that the three of us where we have the same uh, like-mindedness but what if you know there's someone like me who is feeling quite you know like i am keen to learn and get to know about what the church is about but, but I don't know how, how to say it, but it, all of that is, is not as um, collaborated as, 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 as to make it very easy for someone, even if you are casually looking for information, you know who to go to, you know what to do. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that, that's my little... Thank you. Thank you for that. And thank, thank you for opening up about your practical experience. Because, I mean, again, uh, there's a lot of things that you take for granted. I think, as you guys nicely said, it's like, well, it is what it is, but it actually shouldn't, to Mam Simon's point. Mam um, um, Sylvia? Can you hear me? Yes, we can now. Okay. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, my contribution is based on Thursday and uh, sharing our lives. Uh, a question is asked at the bottom there. Think hard how you live and ask yourself what kind of witness am I to those around me? I think it's, uh, it's quite an important uh, question because. Uh, the lesson itself itself uh, reminds us that if the, the church is to partner with God, that is in reaching out to the world, then there is need for us to be able to embrace uh, Jesus' words and ministry. So basically, it's how Jesus uh, handled uh, the ministry, how he preached when he was on this earth, and um, once we do that, and also in collaboration with uh, Second Corinthians uh, three verse two to three, uh, I'll just read it. Uh, you are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read by all men. 
Yeah, we are in a council of Christ. Limited by us, we cannot be in, but by the spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh. That is the thing. So when we try to minister to people, uh, let's ask ourselves: What? what uh, how are we portraying ourselves to to them? How are they reading us? Before we even share the gospel with them, was it not a question of saying, um, do as we say, but what do we do? So, our life needs to be exemplary. And uh, as I said, as the lesson said, we need to embrace how Jesus lived in this act and how he conducted the uh, ministry. And then, just to touch briefly on uh, what uh, my sister who spoke um, uh, the last, uh, just before me. I think the need uh, for the church to be very present uh, with uh, everyone because we are at different levels of spirituality. Even the Bible, this, the Bible itself uh, says so. Some of us are still receiving a meal, some of us is mature and they can now eat uh, bonds. So if the church can be patient before and understand that people are at different levels of spirituality, then uh, deal with uh, different churches according to the needs of the different people. I think uh, that's my contribution for now. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. Um, Mr. Zimpande? And then we'll wrap up. Sorry, guys, I know we're running out of time. Thanks for your patience. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, so for me, this is really very deep and very close to my heart in terms of how, as a church, um, you know, we should be able to, to be the, that light. Now, for me, this is at two levels to Mom's Mang's question. So the first part, it's about the programming. We need to be deliberate about what we do you know, for us to, to achieve the right results. There's no two ways about it. We can be able really to, you know, to cover the whole segment, starting from kids, you know, to the newly baptized, to everybody, and to make the environment, you know, so that it is, um, it is, it is um, appealing, you know, more than appealing, it is applicable to our day-to-day -day lives. So our programming, you know, you know which is man-made, you know, should be deliberate about that, you know, in, in order for us to be, to be practical because we are very theoretical, as we have said, you know, many times, you know, and um, we've, we spiritualize everything that we do to an extent that it almost becomes irrelevant. You know, if I am hungry, if I am sick, you, you just say, yes, I'm going to pray for you. You know, there are times, you know, when we need to be, in most cases, we, you know, to touch lives, we need to be practical about what is going on and what is happening. So, so the corporate programming is very important. The second part of it for me, it's um, at an individual level. The fact that I have been in the church, I have learned the gospel, I am growing as a Christian. When I go to, you know, in, you know, to church, do I just sit by myself and then don't even greet the next person, you know, you know, what am I doing at an individual level? You know, so, so that's a challenge because most of us, we just want to go and read a, a verse or tell someone that we're going to pray, but we are not human about it. We are, we, we are spiritualizing everything instead of being human so that we can attend or meet the needs of, 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 of the people or be able to, you know, to be, to be human to the person next to you. So for me, really, it, it, it's, it's those two levels. Corporate, program it, and individually, what, what has the gospel done? Is it just for me to, to start going and reading the Bible to everybody without really being human about it? Yeah, in the interest Thank of you. time, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, HK, I'm going to give you time to summarize, and then I'll summarize. And then a, a, I see Memorio has a comment there, which I really liked. So I'll give her a chance to say her comment and then pray for us after that. So HK, myself, and then uh, Kendi, if you can do your comments and then pray for us in closing. HK? I think, I think our elder put it very 
uh, the way I was thinking about it is that also I think I want to emphasize the last one. Let's be on a personal level. Let's make an effort to know each other. Make an effort to be accessible also. I think we are, how many of us, I'm just thinking we are 12 of us. If you're by the week or a month, you are have contacts with or any one of us here, it's also another attempt to it. I think that's a good thing. We also criticize the church, but we are not also doing our part. Yes, I think there should be that, that level. I think for me, this lesson also helped me to reflect from individual level, but also to, to have an impact as a church in general. Let's pray about it. God will help us through. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thanks for that. Yes, Uncle Jay, that was a nice summary there as well. And I like what she said about being deliberate. So let's be deliberate about it. Let's not think it will happen automatically. And there's so many things that we can do. When we go into corporates, I've worked in, in graduate recruitment programs, we deliberately integrate people into the corporate environment, so to, to Lerato's point. And we do have a, a mentorship system at church, but I don't think we are deliberate about how it actually works. We, we, we deliberate on assigning mentors and then we leave them on their own devices. So, okay, now you're a mentor, go do it. But there's things that we, again, we need to deliberately institute. Um, there's a church in the Sentin area that has a, a coffee tea hour. So between the lesson and the, and the sermon, there's about a half an hour to 45 minutes time of just socializing, having tea, having, and chatting with people. And, and again, programming is in our hands. Why can't we do that? And have time for people to just sit and have a drink and say, how was your week? And, and you know, can I pray for you? Practical things like that. And I think lastly, in terms of our teachings, uh, we teach a lot of, of what not to do, and maybe we should focus on what to do. So as Christ said, he, he offered people alternatives. Instead of coming and saying, don't do that, he offered better alternatives. So maybe our teaching is a little bit focused on that. So we talk about what the fruit of the spirit is. We assume, as you said, that automatically we know what that means, but maybe we should spend a lot of time teaching what does that actually mean? So what to do? Because I think we know what not to do. There's a lot of what not to do that we've been trained. I want to read this last paragraph. It's on the teacher's summary as well. It says, the church has been called a hospital for the spiritually hurting. And we always say that as well. And it says, this is much more common than the one that calls the church the university for those perishing in ignorance and spiritual darkness. A university in which we are called to enroll as lifelong scholars in residence, learning from Jesus of Nazareth, the master teacher. But the two metaphors, the hospital and university really need to be yoked together in order to give us the fullest understanding of the word church. So church is both hospital and university. It's a place where spiritual healing should be coupled with a religious education that trains us to be disciples and ultimately apostles. Memoya, I'm gonna give you the last comment and then please pray for us in closing. Hi everybody, thank you very much um, for the opportunity. Uh, actually today is the first time um, I'm on the Sabbath school and I've been very happy um, that I had the time to join the Sabbath school lesson. So thank you for the opportunity. My point was on the mentoring of new members. I remember um, when I was baptized, I wasn't born in Adventist by the way. Um, we were still small though, but then, then we joined at that time. But the mentoring of new members, when I was baptized, we had mentors in church and that worked wonders. And I think that has slowly died down in our church, um, which could be of value to the new members right now, because sometimes they do have like follow up questions such as, you know, on the status of the dead or why don't we speak to ancestors? They have follow up questions over and above just an ordinary baptismal class session that they would normally have. So it's always um, good to have those follow-ups, have chats like Lerato um, uh, uh, mentioned earlier that they have their own sessions. Um, so I think that mentorship part is missing now. Um, I know that people are busy with other things, but it, if it can be revived, it would be very important. And then secondly, um, and lastly, is um, I think the church needs to have a very good strategy. Um, when we're looking at current affairs, you need to look at current affairs you need to look at the status of the church and it must be a holistic approach in general for us to have a good strategy on how to proceed going forward. So back to um, uh, 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 Ms. Uh, um, Simang's point as well, it's important to have a strategy as a church 
on how we're going to proceed in terms of our ministry in our locations. Thank you. Please pray for us in closing. Okay. All right. All right. Shall we bow our heads for a word of prayer? Our kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the time that you have given us to discuss your word. We've read during the week and we have been reminded and we've been uplifted. And we thank you, Lord, for these lessons that you give us each and every week, each and every day, that keep us insane, that keep us afloat, that keep us less stressed, because they are all about your word and we need your word today. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this powerful lesson that teaches us about Christian education and help us to continue as we learn more about you to be revived and revive others and be a blessing to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you and bless us this entire Sabbath and may we find a blessing and peace. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much. That the lesson uh, on YouTube or on Facebook is starting at 11, the next session. And I've had a great time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sabah, hallelujah, 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 amen. Pangisu kubu ya kwako, sindi sisi lindile, uya kudu lalom Sabela si tule, dumo dumo kwingo si. Hallelujah, 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 Amen. Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Oh, and I